Andrew Huberman's compelling discussions on adrenaline, frustration, and noradrenaline offer valuable insights into our body's responses to stress and difficulties. Adrenaline and noradrenaline, both released in response to stress, can amplify alertness, focus, motivation, and physiological functions like heart rate, breathing rate, and blood pressure. You know, we're essentially just this collection of cells, and yet everything is organized in this almost video game virtual reality like version of the world. So the way that neuroscientists think about these th sorts of things nowadays is in the following way, that you're absolutely right, Tom. Everything about life experience is an abstraction. Interestingly, feelings of frustration can stimulate the release of these chemicals. However, noradrenaline can trigger the release of cortisol, a stress hormone with potential negative effects such as weight gain, anxiety, and depression. You know, what is the physiological signature for what we call anxiety or fear um, that hadn't really been addressed in a, in a realistic-ish format because it's been hard to study in the lab and virtual reality allowed that to happen. Then the pandemic hits and my lab had teamed up with our associate chair of psychiatry, Dr. David Spiegel, who's a um, wor the world expert in the clinical applications of hypnosis. I know hypnosis case. Sleep, meaning getting enough quality sleep, 80% of the nights of your life. And I always say the other 20%, just try and make it the fact that you're not getting enough sleep for fun reasons. Out with friends, relationship, like ideally it's not because you're lying in bed stressing or et cetera. But try and get enough quality sleep 80% of the nights of your life. How much sleep do you need? Enough to feel rested during the day. Maybe you need a short nap. Napping's great, as long as it doesn't screw up your nighttime sleep. How long should a nap be? No longer than 90 minutes. And if you can't nap, don't, don't worry about it. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, you don't have to be a napper. But a lot of people need a nap in the early afternoon or late afternoon in order to reset. That's totally normal. It has to do with body temperature regulation. Oh, as your body temperature goes up in the afternoon and then starts to drop, you tend to get a little bit sleepy. One way to avoid the afternoon crash, by the way, is don't drink caffeine for the first hour and a half to two hours after you wake up. Let a bunch of the sleepy molecules get cleared away. Sleep molecules, things like adenosine, blah, blah, blah. And then drink your caffeine. At first, it's kind of painful to do, but you'll just go all day feeling great. It's pretty, pretty fantastic. <clears throat> now, alcohol disrupts the architecture, the quality of your sleep. You can fall asleep, but the sleep you get is not restorative. And the first part of your night when you sleep is really for repair of the body, growth hormone release, et cetera. The second half is when two things happen. One is you tend to have dreams that are very emotionally laden, but you are paralyzed. You have sleep atonia. Um, you can't move. And it's a kind of trauma therapy. You actually, if you ever had like a disturbing interaction or something's bothering you, if you get a few nights good sleep, you're like, okay, like it's, it's like water under the bridge. If you don't, people tend to kind of maintain the emotional load of things. Mm -hmm. Now, the sleep atonia is kind of interesting. Has anyone here ever um, woken up and you were still paralyzed? Uh, yeah. And they jolt? to my wife. It's terrifying. Yeah. Well, it happens more often to cannabis users. But it's uh, it's not uncommon for, for non-cannabis users too. So you wake up and it's just like you kind of jolt awake. Um, it's pretty terrifying actually to be wide awake, but you can't move. But that's what it's like in that second half of the night of sleep. If you drink alcohol, you tend to screw up the first part of the night of sleep. And so the physical repair doesn't happen as well. You know, psilocybin at the macro dose used once or twice in a therapeutic setting can really help people move through depression and trauma and maybe even eating disorders and maybe some other things too. Wow. It seems to create some sort of opportunity for learning new relationships between things. Like if you're somebody who's always felt like you were going to fail in life or you couldn't get over a loss or a death or a relationship, like it does allow people somehow to imagine new possibilities. In fact, 66% of people that in those trials found lasting relief years or more wow. from psilocybin. Now that doesn't mean go crazy recreational psilocybin. Also, I'm just citing what Matthew Johnson who's like the leader, one of the leaders in this field told me, I was like, what about microdosing? And he, I was and, ask. and he said, mm -mm. he said very little evidence. Maybe it's because the studies aren't done yet, but at least to my knowledge, very little evidence. He said macro dosing. Hmm. So that was kind of surprising. That's On the one hand, you could imagine that the way to shift one's brain and body around a, a traumatic event or some challenge would be to really fully embody all the emotions and bodily sensations of that thing. And then over time, desensitize yourself. So that's one form of gradual dissociation from at least the emotional component of something. You could also imagine that the goal is to split those off at the outset. And I'll just mention, you know, we, we hear nowadays a lot about a FDA approved therapy, which is ketamine therapy. 
Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. It's being used to treat depression and trauma. This is kept in emergency rooms now. This has been widespread use. Work from my colleague Carl Dyseroth's lab at Stanford has shown the precise neural networks in the brain that are activated by ketamine in uh, an animal model, but also in humans. And it's very clear that it causes th this dissociative state. It actually uncouples brain areas that normally would be coupled. And so you think, well, that's weird. I thought that in order to heal trauma, you're supposed to go into the trauma and then reduce the amount of emotion. But in these ketamine induced states, people actively report things like, I was watching myself, third personing myself go through the experience, which is exactly what you hear about people who went through a trauma, you know, horrible sexual, you know, things like uh, sexual trauma, like rapes. People say mm -hmm. I was floating above my body and could see it happening as somebody else. And yet the therapy for a lot of these, many of the therapies designed to treat trauma are exactly this, the sort of dissociative process that is occurring during the trauma. So I don't have an answer as to why those treatments can work, despite embodying the same kind of approach that happened during the trauma. What does seem to be the case is that accessing the state of mind that was occurring during the trauma or during anxiety or insomnia or pain, and then third personing that experience and being able to imagine a different bodily or mental response seems to be the, the common theme through all treatments for trauma, fear, anxiety, et cetera. Is the element of pain. I think that understanding that pain and pleasure are in this really dynamic balance can also help us which in the following way. Any pain that you feel, the longer day, the less sleep, the, the kind of agony that things aren't working, that power outlet doesn't work, or the internet is slow, whatever it is, the amount of pleasure that you will eventually experience is directly rela related, excuse me, to how much pain you experience. So we know this from actually what nowadays would be considered quite barbaric and unethical experiments where they would give people electrical shocks and they would measure their response. And then they'd say, we're gonna increase it, we're gonna increase it. Eventually they get to the point where a slight a shock that was previously very painful actually evokes a sense of pleasure. <laughs> now you couldn't do these experiments anymore. These are not the experiments I do in my lab. These are older experiments. But for instance, uh, and this has been discussed in scientific research papers, uh, giving somebody a, like a, a 10 minute ice bath, for instance, or even a three minute ice bath, or a one minute ice bath is quite painful. But there was a study from University of Prague, a European Journal of Physiology showed that after a painful ice bath stimulus, the amount of dopamine release goes up for two and a half hours to 250% above baseline. And that's not because the ice bath itself evokes dopamine release. A lot of people think, oh, cold water evokes dopamine release. No, pain evokes dopamine release after the pain is over. Yesterday I tweaked my back because I do this stupid thing every few years, the same stupid thing, and it, it's really painful. And then you just remember all the ways in which you can't move around. I was like standing up this morning, I'm like, ah, uh, and just walking is so painful. As the pain has started to dissipate, you get a little bit of a high, right? You get a little bit of a euphoria, that's dopamine, because of the, the degree of pain that you experienced previously predicts how much pleasure. So when you start a company down in the dregs and you're shoveling again, that's beautiful because that means that the win that you achieve is going to be as good or greater than the one you had previously in your case with Quest. Yeah, I do think fear can be fuel and it's very powerful fuel. I think that I like the idea actually of using it as a visualization. I think that if you look at the trauma literature, one of the things that we know is that trauma has, a, has many different aspects to it, but one of the hallmarks of trauma is two things really. One is a confusion about who's responsible. This is often the case. The brain somehow gets confused about who was responsible for something terrible. Even though we know rationally that wasn't my fault, we still, it, it's like almost like the nervous system is trying to resolve something and we get this kind of reverberation of all the terrible feelings. And the other thing that's been shown time and time again is that people really need to not hide from that experience. They need to be able to confront the memory of the experience or the person of the, you know, or whatever it was. And of course that should be done in a clinical setting if it's something very severe. But, you know, we, we've all probably, or at least in California, we've heard of, you know, there's like love and kindness meditation where people will do a meditation specifically aimed towards cultivating a sense of gratitude, which is a beautiful and wonderful practice. It's actually associated with um, the liberation of a different molecule, serotonin, which is, makes us feel good about what we have. Serotonin is sort of the molecule of satiety of, of feeling like we have enough in our immediate experience. Dopamine and adrenaline are really about moving forward 
or away from things. It's about n not feeling comfortable where you're at, either because you're craving or because you're afraid, right? So these uh, molecules are interesting because they really do kind of separate themselves into different psychologies, if you will. So when that is very hard to control the mind with the mind, and I think a simple rule that people can adopt is when your mind is not where you want it to be, look to your body. Use the body to shift the mind. It's a simple equation. It's sometimes hard to do because thoughts can be so all encompassing. But when your mind is not where you want it to be, if you don't feel as happy or you're obsessing, you need to go to a mechanical system in the body because if you do that, you'll shift the chemicals that are released in your brain in a way that will allow you to regain control of the steering wheel. So there are a couple things that can do that immediately. Um, the most basic one and the simplest one is going to be with respiration, with breathing. So breathing and the neurons that control breathing are so interesting because they are constantly working. They work reflexively all the time. They're working right now. If you're alive and you're listening to this, you, they're working. But unlike a lot of aspects of our brain body connection, we can grab a hold of it immediately and, and start tinkering with it. Like I can't say right now, hey, start digesting faster, Andrew, you know, or tell my intestines, hey, you know, slow down digestion, or I can't make my heart rate speed up just by telling it to, but I can slow down or speed up my breathing if I want to. Oh, okay, foundational things. Get more, get sunlight in your eyes in the morning, especially on cloudy days, as many days of your life as you can yep. and make it a pleasurable thing. Yeah. Right. Just get up and get outside, get out on a porch, get outside, you know, take sunglasses, just do it. Right. Um, uh, most days, if not every day, try and get your sleep right now. Younger people with different schedules, like don't give up a social life, but you know, try and get a good amount of sleep. Get good at that. Some people are great sleepers. Some people aren't very good idea. If you want to be healthy to do three days a week of weight training, we're talking about 10 minutes of warm up and 50 to 60 minutes of working out. If you want, we have a, a schedule like of a, that encompasses all this. That's on huberlab.com. You get it free. There's nothing to sell here. It's just like a fitness toolkit that we have a sleep toolkit, all that zero cost. Oh, wow. You just download it as a PDF, three pages. So you Amazing. don't have to listen to me talk. Yeah. Then I would say three days a week of resistance training and train your legs. Guys, come on. You know, like, have, like, come on. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and uh, <laughs> and three days a week of some cardiovascular work. People might say, well, listen, I'm in my 20s or 30s. Like, I'm not worried about it. It's not about being worried about a heart attack. It's about maintaining blood flow to everything. Where it just seems like the more is better mentality, more interactions being better. And, and it's been shown and he you know, gives data to support this, that over and over again, the ability to just drop into focused work or work in small teams. You know, I'm very blessed now. You know, my podcast team is a wonderful group of four people, more or less. Um, having a small team is really beneficial. If you look in military special operations, they're very aware of limiting team size in terms of, you know, operators that work in groups of, you know, four to six to eight. You can do incredible outsized things when a small group like that, when things get too big, it just uh, it just wicks out in, and that's also when problems start arising. That's that's when people start making mistakes. Uh, oversight is a, is one source of that. Fatigue is another. And you know, I guess this is all to say that learning to cultivate a, a, a life of focus, and I should say it should be produce the way to support that is to have components of your day of wordlessness and defocus. I do want to emphasize that because it's not about waking up and from morning till till night being ultra focused.